Is it possible to significantly lower your fasting glucose in just a few weeks' time? Some of you have been trying for years and haven't been able to do it, yet I'm going to show you in this video how many type 2 diabetics can do it in just a few short weeks. Well, hello and welcome to the Pollock House. It is a Thursday morning and I'm about to do something that diabetics do a lot and non-diabetics hardly do at all. I'm going to test my morning fasting blood sugar. Let's go down the hallway and see what it is this morning. Well, welcome to my lab, otherwise known as my bathroom. And this is where I generally test my blood sugar. And here it is early in the morning, just a little bit after 6 a.m. And I'm going to see what my fasting blood sugar is. I have not uh, eaten a thing since last night around 6 or a little after 6. I think I finished my meal. So it has been about 12 hours since I had my last meal. And this is what people know as fasting blood sugar. Fasting blood sugar is important. It's not the only measure, of course, and it's really not the one that uh, doctors will use to diagnose diabetes. They will typically use the A1C score. But the fasting blood sugar is significant. I kind of think of it as a pop quiz. Let's see what it is this morning. 98. Well, that's a little bit higher than it has been. I was hoping for a little better, but still, it's a definite improvement. Let's go to the studio and we'll talk about fasting blood sugar and some ways you can get that number down. Even though I have this Beat Diabetes YouTube channel and we have thousands of people watching my videos about diabetes and how to lower your blood sugar and A1C, sometimes I struggle a little bit myself in some of these areas and need to take a dose of my own medicine, or to put it another way, to practice what I preach. I did a video with my wife Benedicta a few weeks ago where we tested oats and whole wheat toast versus Fruit Loops and white toast. Now, I knew both these meals would raise my blood sugar significantly, and they did. But what I was not expecting was that my fasting blood sugar, the number I started with before eating those meals, would be as high as it was. Before the first test, my fasting blood sugar was at 111, and my pretest before the second meal revealed a 113. Now, those numbers were totally unacceptable to me, and I was ashamed to have to declare them on the video. They were what they were, and there was no getting around it. But afterwards, I knew I was going to have to take some steps to get that fasting blood sugar down. Well, I'm happy to report that the steps I have taken have worked pretty well. I went from fasting blood sugar around 110 to 115 to fasting blood sugar in the 90s and once in a while in the 80s. So for today, I'm going to take a few minutes and share the steps that I took that seem to have caused my fasting blood glucose to drop by almost 20 points. And the exciting thing about this is that it did not take a year. It didn't take several months. Within just a couple of weeks, my blood sugar retreated and became a lot more satisfying to me. So what did I do? Well, first I have to confess to you that although I've talked about creating a smaller window of eating, I didn't practice that too much. I usually did skip breakfast a couple of times a week and drink bulletproof coffee, but on the other days I didn't pay much attention to how much time in the day my meals were spread out. The problem for me was I've been in the habit of having late dinners for years, and old habits like that are hard to break. I tend to be kind of a workaholic, and since so much of my work is done here at home, I tend to work long past the time that most people knock off their work and head for home. I would usually work past 5, past 6, past 7, and then sometimes even until around 7.45 or even after 8 before we would eat. This meant that probably some of the time when I went to bed, I'd still have food in my stomach and my insulin levels would be higher than they needed to be, even though by most people's standards, my meal would be fairly low in carbs. But after getting these two fasting glucose numbers, 111 and 113, I decided once and for all I was going to have to curb my appetite for work, exercise a little self-discipline, and start eating much earlier. 
I decided that 6 p.m. would be our normal dinner time and no more food would touch my lips until around 8 a.m. the next morning. I took a second step to help with my fasting glucose numbers. Although I had already been eating low carb, I decided to make dinner lower carb even still. Essentially, this meant that my dinner would be meat and low carb vegetables, no beans, no bread, no fruit, no starches, and of course, no sugar. One dinner might be a hamburger patty and a garden salad, or I might have spaghetti sauce over spaghetti squash noodles with an avocado, or chicken with a can of green beans. I deliberately gave up on the idea of incorporating very many foods in my dinner. I'm convinced that one of our problems is we simply eat too much food and too many kinds of foods at our meals. And the more different food you eat at a particular meal, the more likely it is that some of these are going to be a bit of a problem for your blood sugar or the combination of them. So most of my dinners these days have usually about two ingredients, meat and a salad or meat and an avocado or meat and a can of green beans. I've never forgotten that one comment where someone told of their grandma who was diabetic and managed to live into her 90s by eating hamburger patties and green beans or fried chicken and green beans every night. Sometimes I'll eat a meal like that and tell my wife, this is my granny meal. A third step that helps is simply to decide not to stuff yourself at dinner. Now, don't leave the table famished, but don't leave it stuffed either. There is no law that says you must stuff yourself until you cannot eat any more when you have dinner. If you want to stuff yourself, do it at lunch rather than at dinner. Or better yet, don't do it at all. A fourth step I took was to add another day of skipping breakfast to my week. I had been doing this two and sometimes three times a week, but now I started doing it from three to four times per week. It didn't take long for the results to manifest. Not only did I not see fasting glucose in the 110s anymore, lately I don't even see it above 100. Clearly, the changes I made were working just as I had hoped, and in fact, they came about quicker than I had expected. Now, I'm not going to guarantee you I'll never have another fasting blood sugar number over 100. Our bodies are delicate mechanisms, and there are other things that can drive blood sugar up, such as stress and lack of sleep. But I've seen a big difference, and I have a sneaking feeling that most type 2 diabetics could see a definite and significant improvement in their fasting blood sugar by following those four steps I just shared with you. To review these steps, they are Number one, eat dinner no later than 6 p.m. Number two, make dinner very low carb. You should probably make it the lowest carb meal of your day. Three, let your dinner meal be slightly smaller than you're used to eating. Cut back the portion size a bit. And four, skip around three to four breakfasts each week. You may want to have a mug of bulletproof coffee in place of breakfast, which should not raise your blood sugar much, if any at all. Now, since three out of these four rules have to do with dinner, let's talk a little bit about the dinner meal and why it's so important for those wanting to corral their blood sugar. And make no mistake about it, dinner is extremely important. It can make you or break you. When you eat dinner, you're setting the metabolic pace for your body for the next 14 hours or so. If you eat a high-carb monster of a meal, you'll force your pancreas to overwork. You'll send your glucose levels sky-high, and you'll raise your insulin levels far beyond the healthy range. And this could go on for hours and hours and even still be affecting you while you sleep peacefully in your bed. Unless you're a late-night snacker, and I surely hope that you're not, your dinner is going to be the last food your body sees for a good long while. Eat a high-carb meal and you're asking for trouble. Eat a moderate-carb meal and you're still causing some problems. But eat a very low-carb meal and you're doing yourself a tremendous favor. Your blood sugar level will quickly get back to its normal level and may even drop below normal. And while you sleep, your pancreas is resting, your insulin levels are low and getting lower, and you're setting yourself up for a much happier number that will be revealed on your blood sugar monitor in the morning. Another reason for eating a light, very low-carb dinner is that in the evenings, we typically don't do too much. We watch a little television on the couch, perhaps, read a bit, talk a little, and go to bed. 
The evenings are our least physically active times of our days. And then, when we go to sleep, we're even less active. We sort of go into hibernation mode. So if we're dealing with a lot of carbs from our suppers, we're not in a very strong position to do it well. Physical activity helps our bodies to process carbs and sugars. And if our carbs are not dealt with by the time we go to bed, things will be worse still overnight. And this may be one reason why you're waking up with terribly high numbers on your blood sugar meter. But by eating early and eating a very low-carb, relatively light dinner, you're making things so much easier for yourself, and your body will probably thank you later when you check your blood sugar that next morning. And if you can follow these dinner rules day after day and year after year, you will be miles, or for some of you, kilometers ahead of where you would otherwise be. And the neat thing about all this is that it isn't all that hard to do. You don't have to go to bed starving. You've eaten a nice dinner, but you've eaten it earlier enough in the evening so that it's going to work for you and not against you. So, the moral of the story is take it easy at dinner time. Go light, go low carb, go early. Follow Granny's advice and eat your meat and green beans, or meat and salad, or meat and an avocado, or meat and a celery stick with peanut butter, or meat and a green pepper, or, well, you get the idea. Give it a try. Test these four rules for a few weeks and see how they work for you. And after you've done it for several weeks, leave a comment about your experience. Well, that's it for now. If you appreciated the video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and then clicking that little bell icon so that you'll be notified every time we post a new video. God bless and see you again soon.